So good morning and welcome and thank you so much. Hello to all unicorns. And uh, it's very exciting to find out where you are on your journey. I remember being on my journey last year. My name is Shirsten Hurley. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Tina. So today we're going to be looking at building public health communication systems that are credible and full of accurate information that are worthy of trust. So here in the UK today, um, we've got 44,000 over uh, positive cases. We've had 45 deaths within the 28 days of the pandemic. 50 million, um, nearly 60 million people have now had their vaccine. 42nd, um, 40, 46 million have had their second dose of vaccine. And now 15 million people have had their booster. So there's lots that's positive, but there's still lots to, uh, to do. And we have still not contained this pandemic. We're still very much within it. And I'm going to be talking about the UK perspective a little bit, but hopefully sharing enough um, detail with you that you can use it both today and ongoing through your infodemic career. So here in the UK, we've got a lot of historical vaccine development. We've benefited from vaccine development all over the world and we've implemented a lot of vaccine programs. And that's made us very aware of how to develop program materials, both healthcare professional materials and uh, the materials for the public that explain the risks and the benefits of the, of the vaccination and support the healthcare practitioners to implement the programme. And we've had our fair share of, of infodemic issues in the past. I'm sure you're all familiar with MMR and the situation around the MMR scandal. And we certainly saw that blowing up into the 90s and affecting the uptake of the MMR. But it was interesting that even whilst there was an issue with the MMR and concerns that were unfounded, a paper that was later rescinded, in the Lancet, we still found that confidence in the UK in the other parts of the routine programme remained high. And that's an important factor to remember. So during the pandemic, uh, we, we've been um, social listening and thinking and looking forward to the anticipation of the development of a vaccination. So this was very much pre-vaccination programme, using those findings and media monitoring to shape our communications and resources, to promote the routine programme, to continue to strengthen that, because obviously there was a lot of disruption to the routine programme. A lot of parents um, thought that there was no vaccine still available. So we needed to continue to do work to bolster the routine programme. All the communications have been iterative because we've been learning as we go, as I'm sure you all have. It's a novel pathogen. It has novel behaviours and we just didn't know. But the trouble with not knowing is you create there's an information void. And during those periods in the early part of the pandemic, social listening began to reveal um, a lot of um, a lot of spurious and difficult um, situation of people trying to work out where it was coming from, what was happening, trying to answer those questions, and the scientific information wasn't quite there yet. So with all of our programmes, we have surveillance, and we have our yellow card system, much like you have in other countries, and that's a, an opportunity for both the healthcare practitioner and also the public to report um, uh, side effects of any vaccines or any medicines, in fact. And we would use those uh, changes and findings as we went through to change and adjust leaflets, posters from resources, including the Green Book, in anticipation of the development of a vaccine. So we had a lot of emerging themes. And I think it was really important to understand about these themes. A lot of you will be very familiar with this information relating to quack cures, saltwater gargles, 5G masks, not believing the pandemic is happening is still a problem. Um, tr transmission fears, disbelief that it's actually happening. But it's really important to remember that the, the health professionals in any country, including in our country, are also members of the public and actually are vulnerable to misinformation just as much as people outside the health profession. And that was something that was quite a new revelation to me, that even people who are very competent in their field, quite high level, in the state of panic in a pandemic, were very vulnerable to um, misinformation and I had quite high level uh, medical practitioners contact me to ask me about the contents of vaccines and to ask me about some of these issues so uh, misinformation and disinformation can affect health professionals at every level and that was particularly prominent when we had large-scale backed actors promoting bleach and untested cures and we have seen some significant activity both in the UK and in Europe and further afield of um, health professionals actually being part of the misinformation Epidemic story, part of the misinfodemic problem. 
So if we look at who's most trusted in the UK, we have the NHS and nurses and doctors are listed as the most trusted health professionals. But in a climate where even the health professionals are concerned and have information poised themselves, it really does test your system and our systems have been severely tested. The public do have high levels of trust in the information that they receive from healthcare professionals. And pre-pandemic, 95% of parents said they had great confidence in the programme. They agreed that vaccines were effective and that they said that vaccines, that they trusted vaccines. And we had good uptake of most of the vaccines in the routine programme. And it was clear where people were getting their information. 54% of people were getting information from the NHS leaflets. We have the Red Book, the Infant Red Book in the UK, and that's a really good tool to record developmental milestones and also records all important vaccine um, doses and that familiarizes parents and children and infants with the vaccine process and hopefully engages them in these health behaviors for the remainder of their lives. So 23% at that point were getting the information from the internet and 19% were getting from the NHS website. So we felt that we had in terms of emergency preparedness a good health system with good clear information that was able to talk to the, the uh, public using various channels including the internet including the website but most of all including tangible analog paper leaflets given to people by health professionals and retained very equitable here in the uk we have up to 11 million people who experience digital poverty or are disenfranchised from the digital uh, world because of um, access issues literacy is issues, um, poverty, and all of the other factors. So who do they look to to get their information? In all other situations, a uh, vaccination program would be led by my boss, uh, Mary Ramsey, and she would do the, um, the, the speeches and, and, and health messagings around vaccination, and it would be a fairly low level media um, activity, uh, but obviously a very positive one where we introduce new programs, as I showed you earlier on that timeline. One of our most recent was the Hexavalent program, and that was introduced and implemented at pace and very well received. In the pandemic, we had senior politicians giving it messages. And if we go back to the slides to look at where senior politicians are and we look at where they are in terms of trust, there are nurses and doctors. If we look down the bottom here at 16 percent government ministers and 15 percent politicians, it's clear <clears throat> that messages from, from politicians, even though they are our leaders, are less trusted by the public. And that's an important factor to recognise when giving your messages supportively. It's really important to use trusted voices. So if we go back, we spent a lot of time and we spend a lot of time horizon scanning, detecting, listening and understanding. And we recognise that the public and health professionals get their information in quite a different ecology now. Um, it's really, really changed over the last couple of years. We see a massive upswing in people getting their information through their peers on closed um, applications such as WhatsApp. And I'm sure you're on, on the Unicorn WhatsApp group and you know how handy it is to share information. Lots of you will be on Facebook. Um, other platforms are rather available. We've also got Instagram and Twitter and Zoom. Not many people knew about Zoom before the pandemic, but now we all know about Zoom. So um, it, mainstream media has really come to the fore as well. And whether we looked at any of these platforms or all of them together, it was very clear that there was evidence of real world harms and there were gaps in the knowledge and there were areas that we needed to address quite rapidly. So we use that combined model of on and offline listening, collecting anecdotal and frontline information from people at the coalface is really important. However scattered that may be, sometimes you will get um, a signal quite quickly that's conversationally um, revealed to you. And then you'll be able to pick that up and use your social listening to delve a bit deeper to find out who's sharing what and where and actually what level of risk that does pose to your health behavior and your health work. Providing a range of resources is at the heart of all of our um, health programs, whether they are for um, communicable diseases or non-communicable diseases. We use a multi-channel approach. We use um, FAQs and shareable content. And we've certainly seen the use of short form video and posters and outdoor um, 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 materials for street campaigns being incredibly important. So it's that shared model 
between the on and offline world is really, really effective. Simple signs on streets in terms of sprayed signs on the ground have actually been just as useful as encouraging social distancing as any amount of actually online um, um, material and communications. So when the vaccine arrived and we had to do some work on that, some early indications were that people had a reasonably similar level of confidence in anticipation of this vaccine that we'd certainly see before we introduced previous vaccines, even right back to diphtheria. Up to 50% of people would not be sure, and, and some people would be less likely to take it, other people would like to wait and see, and we see a very similar profile for every single vaccine, and it was no different for the, um, for the COVID-19 vaccines. So in order to make this program work and to roll it out at pace, it needed to be iterative. So as we move through the versions of for each cohort, we we're also able to take in the types of information that we'd need, going right back to that original slide. Sorry, we're zooming back and forth a bit, but we do need to focus on this. So <clears throat> you're picking up information from social media and listening and identifying the level of risk. You're then looking at surveillance of the program, uptake and operational fee feedback from people implementing the program, putting that with pharmacovigilance and coronavirus reporting, and then revising the green book, the training, the advice and the guidance. So I hope everybody's familiar with the green book of immunization and that really formed the basis of the rollout for the pandemic and in there we were able to address some of the key questions for professionals about transmission, about level of, of um, up to, uh, uh, sorry, of level of protection etc. So that book, that green book chapter is now on 17 um, 17th iteration and most of our leaflets and our resources are on versions six, seven and eight. That means that any given time, the public is receiving a leaflet that is clinically safe, that is shaped towards the aims of the programme, that outlines the risks and the benefits in a very transparent and clear way, gives important information about access, and then we make sure that it also gives a good idea about the side effects, and the most common side effects and the less common side effects. So as we've moved through, <clears throat> we're now onto version um, seven and we're now in a mop-up situation where we see good uptake, but we could do better. There are still uh, several million people in this country that have not had their first dose. In order for people to have the right information, we need to make sure it's the right format and for the right audience. <clears throat> Blind and partially sighted people need braille or large print. For people who are deaf, they need sign language videos. We've also shaped our materials for looked after settings such as prisons, for people experiencing homeless, for refugee groups, for at-risk groups, for non-native speakers, for gypsy, Roma and traveller groups. We've made sure that we do age-related tailoring and also gender tailoring. We like to show in our leaflets people as they are so that they're representative of the population, that they are culturally sensitive and they also target different lifestyles. They also target different ways of living, different ways of working, different cultural and religious um, um, dominations. So um, <clears throat> we made sure that we did also work for healthcare petitioners and social care staff and unpaid carers by shaping and tailoring the information to people's needs and uh, working with them to co-produce it and test it we're able to produce a product that not only lands well evidence is well and is well received but also has some some really important factors in it it conveys the information but it has other work to do so when we revise and iterate each, uh, each leaflet, the main aim is to inform and build confidence in the programme for each cohort of eligibility. We're also adding vaccines as we go along. We're adding user and operational feedback. We're adding surveillance and any pharmacovigilant notices, any signals. We also use stakeholder feedback and focus groups and webinars. And we also use user and healthcare worker feedback. And all of those issues shape the next version of this leaflet to make sure that what the public is getting is our very best product. Essential to create positive sentiment, sometimes that's forgotten. It's not just conveying the information in a culturally and, and, and gender specific sense, but it's also creating positive sentiments. Every resource has a job to do it. And peer to peer building confidence is really important. The humble sticker can work really hard for you 
in relation to what you pay for it, it can do a lot of work and signaling it. And we see good use of digital stickers and digital banners online. It doesn't actually have to be a tangible asset. It can be a digital asset. But the all important record card and using symbols um, within it that are representative. So this little crown here is our coronavirus. And we know the heart symbol is very well received. And we know that this uh, particular sticker has been evidenced as being quite significant in driving some people. Some people went to get their vaccine just because they wanted a sticker. It's very, very simple. Inside every human is somebody that just, you know, does, does have desires and does want things. And how can we utilize those types of, of, of assets to make sure that people signal to each other, I've had my vaccine. Have you had your vaccine? Have that conversation. And it's very clear that it's, this works at all age groups. That's really important. You're not just building a sentiment in one age group, you're building sentiment in a population. So you have to make sure that it works in a range of users. Um, it's really important when it becomes a tool to catalyze change. We know that with misinformation, disinformation, people can sort of push themselves back into a corner. We also always need to leave the door open so that they can come back out and they can change their mind. Um, fear is, has been a great driver of decision making. And for some people, not doing anything feels better than doing the wrong thing. So making sure that you provide assets as well as the space to have those conversations and for it to allow people to change their minds. People are allowed to change. Testimonials, really, really helpful. The testimonial of healthcare workers is important as, as the eligible public. The right image is really powerful. So at the moment we're offering vaccines to children who are 12 to 17. I can work with my designers as long as I like, um, but do everything that I wanna do, but I can't capture the, this kind of spirit. And it's this kind of spirit of these, these young girls, they've got their leaflet in their hand, they've got the record card. That image is gonna be a lot more powerful to the, to the UK public and to, uh, to uh, school children in this age group than any amount of, of material that I provide. So addressing inequality is incredibly important and there's inequalities and missing disinformation. So reaching people where they are is, is, is important and recognizing that people, we, we hear a lot about people being hard to reach we prefer to think about them being underserved. They're, we know where they are really. Everybody's known where they are. We've had an awful lot of, of research projects in the UK, which have, have tried to look at what are the problems in uptake of vaccination. And we always come back to the three factors of access, access and access. The group of people that are resistant to it, you know, are never gonna change. The swing voter in the middle of somebody that hasn't decided to come yet. Often it's access, it's the root of their issues. How can we get them to the place to have a conversation about vaccines? And then for those conversations to build up to a decision about having a vaccine. Part of what we do is we make sure that the information is search engine optimized so that we have a HTML version of every single publication so that that caters very well for people accessing digitally. But we also have the um, why do I have to wait posters and the BSL versions available for healthcare professionals to, to access and order. And significantly, it's been incredibly important to provide long form translations and also short form translations. And in addition to that, audio translations for some cultures and many of you will know better than I do I've been on a big learning curve learning about the Sileti people various people in Somalia who have a very oral culture and therefore audio um, versions of what we've, we've produced for these groups and they've landed very very successfully and can act simple audio versions a bit like radio adverts can be really really quick to produce cost effective and a really good way of you talking to communities where they are so you're going to use trusted voices um, and using existing relationships. And we've, we've certainly worked very well to co-produce resources with all of these groups. It's been really important to work with faith leaders and health professionals, to work at people with different agendas and age and life stage and lifestyle. Female voices for many communities are very much key. And using community leaders in non-secular um, settings as well is very important. Not everybody is engaged in a religious group or community. Talking to elders and charity support groups, outreach and health visitors. These are all the people that you can start to engage with in order to make your messages um, more acceptable to those communities to actually listen and get some wisdom about what will work. These communities are very, very clear about their community. These uh, leaders are very clear about their communities. They understand them well, and they can often give you very good insights into how you can build your um, communications, what will work for their communities, and also what, will, what won't. 
Um, we've had some very well-intentioned work that just doesn't doesn't land successfully. We have to look at why that doesn't um, work as well and then move on. And if it's not working, stop, stop doing it, start doing something different. We've learned that very well in the pandemic. So with content production, use content designers and videographers that are experienced in health messaging. Hopefully we won't always be working in an, uh, an infodemic uh, pandemic, but hopefully we will be working in sort of peace times. It's important that you work with designers and production teams, videographers who, who develop or, or have good experience in health messaging. You can support them with very clear briefs about what you want to do. And you need to establish those briefs by looking at what your key aims and objectives are, working with your team, listening to your health professionals that you're engaged with, listening to the um, insights from the incident management team and the other health system teams that you, you're working with, so that what you give to the designers is a very clear set of instructions, because it is, it is their job to prioritize and, 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 and provide a coherent, cogent hierarchy in your information. And part of good design is always letting things breathe a bit. Less is definitely more. It can be more expensive to produce a longer uh, publication with slightly more space in it, but actually giving more space with it between the text and having culturally relevant imagery can be very powerful in giving your message wings, making your message more effective. If we compare people's use of just the HTML versions of a leaflet and compare them to the PDF version, we often find much more positive sent sentiment with PDF because people are seeing um, themselves within the leaflet or their children or their relatives and they can identify it. It's just more human. So if you're going to use design, give a clear brief. And if you're going to um, produce content, a little and often is better than one big moment. Make sure you use plain and simple languages, short sentences, culturally clear images and diagrams and co-produce with groups and users. Use a test where you can. Often at pace, it's quite difficult to use a test. So have a little user group that you can use as your phone a friend option. We've produced this, can you take a look? Because often they'll send it back to you with really helpful comments and then you're ready to go to the next stage of completing production. Simple and quick is much better than high production values. We certainly learned that with video. Before the pandemic, we'd like to use very high production values, take a few days to make a film. Now we can do it in 20 minutes and we just record a Zoom because ultimately the medium is the message. If people have the information they need in a friendly, positive, clear toe, that's good enough. Get it out. Don't waste any longer. Pre-bunking and using social in inoculation is helpful to increase vaccine literacy. It's, it's helpful to, to develop all um, health literacy. So I, I've made a very vaccine centric presentation, but you can pretty much swap vaccine and swap in other health behaviours that you might want to, to, to help with. Building access literacy, helping people to know where to go and how to get it. Listen to people's concerns. They will tell you what's not working and the people can tell us in so many more ways than they've ever been able to. Sometimes we've learned a lot through tweets. Sometimes we've learned a lot through listening to bus drivers. Sometimes we've learned a lot through listening to rural farmers. It depends. Be where people are. Keep your mind open and broad and don't, don't assume because most assumptions at the heart of them, there is some kind of information that you're not taking in. You need to keep yourself very open and respond to the information with facts and signpost to trusted sources. All these, um, all these steps build confidence and that's what you need to do. So again, in our first phase, we produced a lot of these style of images to so that the public could start to understand how we were prioritizing these groups and understanding that the most vulnerable groups get the vaccines first and that was really important not just for health professionals not just for people um, at the public but also for the media as well to understand giving the media a good understanding and helping them to understand some of these complex facts is really important so are you clear to publish? When we're working on, on making an intervention, we have to work with the communications lead, both within our own organization, often within the government organizations. We need to have clarity about the process and the sensitivities. What's the process? Who do we have to speak to? What clearance does something have to go through? Make sure that whenever you're making something with regards to health behaviors, that you're getting clinical and epidemiological or and operational sign-off every time 
communications um, staff can be absolutely wonderful and amazing, but sometimes what sounds good and what feels right in a media way is not technically or clinically correct and safe. So we need to be quite careful between finding something that works from a media perspective, but understanding what's clinically. Sometimes the clinical issues don't lend themselves to very simple, um, 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 what's the word, you know, reducing down to very simple messages. Sometimes the messaging around vaccinations is certainly in this pandemic have been actually quite complicated. And it's important to be quite honest about that. You need to spend time building relationships and that's with your comms leads, with the people that are going to be managing those inboxes, making sure you know who you need to know to get things through. And also, more importantly, when they get stuck, who to talk to. So be available and be tenacious. Fortune favours the determined. It's so terribly important to just really stick at it and really lean into your team members, get that support and keep checking and keep looking for the, the next stage in the clearance so that you can push all those dominoes in a row down and get your publication out. If in doubt, go simpler, go smaller and get something out rather than going larger and bigger and more complicated and it's spending a lot more time being cleared by the various different departments. Cultural and religious context can be really, really helpful. <clears throat> so shaping messaging, around religious festivals, understanding what people's lives are and how people are living them and how they're celebrating festivals and, 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 um, and uh, parts of their lives that are very important to them and recognize how you can shape the health messaging to be supportive to both those religious or cultural aims and to what people are doing. There comes a point when we all have to deal with something difficult, safety signals and difficult news. Uh, we certainly saw that um, early reporting of safety signals. We saw uh, issues with regard to blood clotting in relation to AstraZeneca, which eventually resulted in AstraZeneca not being given to people that are under 40 years of age. Certainly was given to people earlier in the stage. And as we as the situation unfolded and the reports came in, it's really important to give clear, prompt information, clarify what is known and what isn't. This is what we know and this is what we don't know. Explain the risk and support healthcare practitioners to have a strong understanding of it. And relaying that information in comms to all levels and the public was really, really key. It's very important with the transparency and the trust we have, it's incredibly important to constantly mitigate actions to not threaten the, the, the trust people have in the routine vaccination program and to keep vaccination programs quite distinct. So you're going to have to deal with difficult news, possibly uh, with relating to wisdom. So how do you shape those messages? At what point do you actually release the message? And there is no sweet spot. You just have to act. And I think earlier action is easier, remedial action is easier than later action. And what we've learned in the pandemic that you're never gonna get it perfectly right. But ultimately you have to make a decision based on the data and information around you in tandem with your incident manager and your team and your comms lead and make that answer available and have that clear prompt information. Have your story. So keep your timeline updated. You should have a timeline, even if it's only on the back of an envelope at this stage, you should have a timeline of what information has been dropped when. So seek to control your narrative. Watch that story unfold and beware of everybody wanting a piece of the action. We've really suffered from that in the UK. Everybody wants to do their own guide to COVID vaccination, you know, including lawnmower manufacturers and, you know, farm suppliers, etc. Everybody wants to do their guide. Suddenly everyone's an expert. So try to give them a task if you can, if they ask you. That's a good way of keeping them busy. But if not, and if people insist on making their own guides, do ask them to, to commit to revising the information when it becomes out of date. In terms of debunking misinformation, if you have debunked a subject, don't return to the scene of the crime and don't let others force you. In terms of your timeline, we dealt with 5G back in January. So from January onwards, once we, we dealt with that, it'd been fact-checked by various organizations. We had good evidence that it was completely spurious. So as the story came up in, in different arenas and circles over the year, we don't return to it. 
the narrative has moved on. So choose which ideas you want to deal pre-bunk and keep the focus. Resist including everything each time. Our dear colleagues, our, 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 our epidemiological college, colleagues and our clinical colleagues will always want to include an awful lot of information. <clears throat> when we know in terms of content producers that actually after a certain point, people don't absorb it. Three part messages work well and not sometimes to the detriment. So get Brexit done. That wasn't the best thing, but it's a very strong message and it certainly worked in, in, in our country. So get and do and avoid X. These sort of simplify the message, always pare it down. Even when it's nuanced, you can still give that answer, that information very clearly in short sentences with a good explanation and also admit where there are uh, information voids. Don't try and cover them up or fluff them up. Governments and, and, and senior people may want you to, but actually that's very unhelpful because it's really important to be clear about what we don't know so that as information becomes clear and we announce it, there's some reliability in our voice. We have credibility. Not all noise is bad or dangerous. Um, it, it's really important to recognise sometimes there will be a natural a natural rising of, in terms of social listening of a subject and people will be naturally talking about it and sometimes just like a wave it'll ebb back down again. There are several factors and we haven't got time for this here and it's not my job but there are several factors as to why something can break out. Sometimes it can be given extra um, impetus on the internet by algorithms. It can be given extra impetus by bot activity. It can be given impetus by different um, bad actors activity. There are lots of reasons why something can suddenly bubble up. But it's deciding at what point you decide that this is actually an issue that we'd like to prioritize for action and always return. If in doubt, Reinforce your national program messaging around health behaviours, around safety and trust and acceptability and the right to protection of disease. So if in doubt, support other parts of the health system and other parts of the health programme. There's no sweet spot for intervention, so choose your battles. And as I said, work quickly. Perfection is the enemy of action. If we wait until everything's absolutely perfect, the time the, the time will have gone and you've missed that potent point. There's a certain point when if you introduce the information, you can actually create the ripple effect where people begin to share the correct information and slowly the disinformation breaks down. So I'm leaving you with one of the images from our latest government campaign, which starts to use a slightly different, more media heavy technique, stop COVID hanging around. And I'm going to open up the floor for any questions.